Um, my talk today is about using function points for economic analysis, which is a topic that I've always been interested in. And first, the reasons for the success of function points is that the older lines of code metric has really not been particularly successful because it only covers a small part of the total work that goes into building software applications. In fact, in today's world, um, coding with high-level languages like Ruby and Java is really only less than about 25% of the effort. And the other main task, including paper documents, such as requirements and specifications and finding and fixing bugs. And so it's almost professional malpractice to use a metric that only covers a fourth of the total effort. Function points, on the other hand, cover 100% of the activity. So they are much more um, embracing than the older lines of code metric. Now, in 2010, and here in 2009, Function points have become a sizing metric for all kinds of applications, embedded, real-time, military, IT. They're standard productivity metrics. They're very useful for measuring quality. As you'll see later, they're very good for measuring schedule. You can also use them for measuring staffing. I often work as an expert witness in lawsuits, and so I know that uh, function points are used in litigation. They're very good for outsource contracts. They're good for cost analysis, but you have to be careful because there are a lot of cost variances that need to be dealt with. And they can also be used for value analysis, but here, too, care is required. Now, some of the newer uses that are only beginning to be explored, in addition to looking at individual applications, you can also scale up function points and look at entire portfolios. And if you work for a large company like a Microsoft or an IBM, you're talking 10 to 15 million function points as the total volume of software owned. I'll show you some portfolios later in the talk. You can also look at backlogs or undeveloped applications that are awaiting to be development. You can use them for certain kinds of risks because many software risks are directly proportional to application size. The larger the application, the greater the risk. You can look at them, I use function points for studying requirements changes. In fact, function points were the first metric to actually allow the rate at which requirements change to be explicitly measured. And by measuring the function point total of an application at the end of the requirements phase, and then measuring the function point total a year or two later when the application is finally delivered, it's been discovered that the average rate of requirements change is more than 1% per calendar month. And it was only function points that allowed the requirements changes to be explicitly measured. Some of the newer uses that I'll be talking about later is that you can also use function points for measuring the usage of software applications, which I think is going to become a major field of study in the future. You can look at function points for delivery of features, such as cloud computing and software as a service, which is going to be another uh, major use of function points. You can look at them for measuring commercial off-the-shelf software, such as Oracle and SAP and Microsoft Office and uh, Windows 7 and some of the other commercial packages. In addition, as I'll talk about later, you can look at them for measuring occupation groups. How many function points are ordinarily used by a project manager or a quality assurance person or a tester? Or for that matter, a ship's captain or an FBI agent, you can use the um, function points to look at the usage of software by almost any kind of occupation group. And finally, in today's world where maintenance actually occupies more people than development, you can also use function points for measuring maintenance work with some exceptions that I'll talk about later in the uh, discussion. Now, there are some issues that need to be resolved between next year and 10 years from now. One of them is that when you build an application, open above the features and the functions that the users want, there are often some technical things like the platforms that the, uh, uh, the application works on and possibly some government mandates or some um, <coughs> requirements for um, legal things that have to be put into applications that the users don't want, but still have to be there. And so one of the questions is, how do you distinguish between the true functional size, which reflects what users want, and these other technical or background issues that are not things that the users want, but actually affect the work of the software? So that has to be dealt with, too. And then for longer range projects, those that last four or five years, you need to deal with things like inflation rate. For applications that are done overseas, you need to look at global variations in work hours and work days. For example, we normally work 40 hours in this country. In Japan, it's about 44 hours. And in Canada, it's about 36 hours. So you need to make adjustments for 
dealing with international situations. Another thing, too, is that function points can be used to measure the performance of any different occupation or specialist that works on a software project, but there are an awful lot of them. We did a study some years ago and discovered that there's almost 90 different occupation groups involved in building software in large corporations. Obviously, everybody uses software engineers, but in addition to that, you have quality assurance specialists, you have testers, you have technical writers, you have database analysts, you have um, web designers, you probably have some standard specialists, you may have metric specialists. You may have as many as 90 different kinds of occupations of which some are only part-time workers and others are full-time workers, but you don't want to leave out too many of those because the cumulative cost of all 90 uh, is fairly expensive. You, we also need to deal with some conversion rules between function points as used in this country, uh, which are IFPUG, International Function Point User Group Function Points, and those that might be used elsewhere. For example, Finland has its own unique function point, Finnish function points, and there's another one in Netherlands. And then there are also cosmic function points, so we need to convert back and forth. We also need to improve the cost, speed, and timing of function points because one of the barriers to adopting this metric is that it's fairly slow and fairly expensive to count function points, and we'll talk about that. Another thing that we need to do are to develop micro-function points for very small changes below the normal level at which function points can be counted, which is about 15 function points. And I think we need to expand the number of benchmarks which currently you can buy from commercial sources like the International Software Benchmark Standards Group. You can buy five or 6,000, and then you can get similar packages from other companies like Gartner or David Consulting or SPR. But I think we need more than 25,000 projects commercially available to have a, at least a representative sample of everything that's being developed. Now, the industry itself is changing, and some of the changes need to be measured. For example, we are moving from the concept of developing software features to the concept of delivering them. When you begin to consider software as a service, or service-oriented architecture, or cloud computing, or things like the set of Google applications that are available online, you are no longer really going to be developing as much as we did in the past. What you're going to be doing is putting together pieces in the form of software as a service, or cloud computing, then these pieces may already exist. And so we need to be able to measure not only the development of applications, which typically have productivity rates of less than 25 function points per staff month, but we need to be able to deal with the delivery of applications that are constructed from large volumes of reusable components, in which case that might be more than 500 function points per staff month. We also need to deal with other delivery issues, such as quality, security, and bandwidth and the various uh, methods for delivering all of these features. Now, if you look at the history of metrics from 1980 through today, what you see are expansions in metrics based on if bug function points. You see expansions on metrics based on the other function points, such as Finnish and Cosmic and Netherlands. You see a decline in measurements based on lines of code. And I regard lines of code as being such a poor metric for economic studies that it really should be viewed as professional malpractice. Not only does it leave out over half of the development activities, but lines of code actually penalizes high-level languages and achieves the best results for lower languages like assembly. And it's a severe penalty against Ruby and Java and C Sharp and C++ and the higher-level languages. So it doesn't really do a good job at all. But at the bottom of this slide, you can see <laughs> that no measurements at all still is the dominant factor. So I think that we need to do a lot more in terms of measurement than we have done so far, <clears throat> because applications that are not measured at all still number more than about 50%.